Thank you. I, I will, uh, I'm going to drive the uh, camera guy nuts. I don't stand still very well. Um, so I will, uh, I will use my teacher voice. Hopefully you can hear me in the back. Um, I, uh, I, I teach school the lady from Chicago. Um, I, I understand and sympathize with her. I kind of am glad to Lori uh, for inviting me up here today because I get out of school yesterday and today. Um, I am Rod McCall. I'm nobody special. I'm nobody big. I'm like you. I was bombarded. I was blindsided. I was kicked in the gut. First by a marriage that didn't work the way I thought it would or should. And then a divorce that was anything that far beyond anything I thought about a divorce. I had no idea about what parental alienation was or hostile aggressive parenting was or any other phrases that we like to use. <coughs> but I learned a lot. I learned it's a killer. It's a killer of self-esteem. It's a killer of personal drive. It is a killer of ambition, self-worth, and relationships. A lot of what Suzanne talked about first thing this morning, I go, amen. And I watched it in my son. I watched it as it destroyed his happy-go-lucky behavior. He's a great kid. And it killed me to see what happened to him. My life was as normal as I thought it could be. My mom and dad celebrated 55 years of marriage this year. They were great role models to my three sisters and I of what marriage is supposed to be. I had a normal middle class upbringing, went to college, took a longer than usual route, but I graduated from college, I got into working, I met my wife, we got married, we, I met her at Walmart, we both worked at Walmart, I used to say she was the best thing that I ever got at Walmart. <laughs> now I will question their uh, return policy. <laughs> but she, uh, she got uh, a master's. Well, she was a police officer. And she uh, quit being a police officer. She moved back to the town where she grew up, which happened to be the town I was going to college in. She got a master's degree. We get married. And we go up to Pennsylvania, come up here to Penn State University where we spend five years where she gets her PhD in criminology. As soon as we are done, she gets job offer down in Dallas. And so we move in 2002 to the bright, sunshiny state of Dallas, Texas. We buy our house. This is it right here, 7110 Longmeadow. It was a nice house, 2,600 square feet, had a pool in the back. I was going, woo, -hoo! I've made it. May not have a white picket fence, but I've made it. I had a teaching job. She had a teaching job. A little over a year later, Eric shows up. All right. That's our pool in the background. We had dogs. She liked Dalmatians. We raised and trained Dalmatians uh, for the stand and look pretty like the kettle club shows, but we also did agility. We had a lot of fun. She was sick a lot. Didn't know why. Later it turned out she had what uh, was diagnosed as pseudotumor cerebri. Now I had no idea what that was, but the doctor explained that we have along our back spinal fluid to provide cushion. And that same spinal fluid goes up and surrounds our brain providing push and then it flows back down, flows up and down, up and down, up and down. Well in her, the valve that we all have, that is it, uh, where the skull and the spine kind of come together, her valve didn't work very well. And it would sometimes allow the fluid to come in, but not to come out. And she would get these massive debilitating migraines. She would spend days, then weeks, 
and at one point just over a month in bed from these headaches. I took care of Eric. I got him up in the morning, took him to school, took him to daycare. I go to work. I come back from school. I pick him up. It was tough. I did the cooking. I did the cleaning. I took care of the dogs. I did most of the domestic work inside the house, outside the house. I did the cooking. I did the shopping. I did the cleaning. It was kind of crappy, but I thought, you know what? This is what you do. When you are a partner in marriage, this is how you act. This is how you work together. She's sick. You take that marriage vow that says, in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. Well, she was sick. This is what I was doing. Eric was sick too. He had a problem with his ears. On his very first birthday, we put ear tubes in. Ear tubes didn't last very long. And he was getting sick and he was constantly being put on antibiotics. On his third birthday, we took out the old ones, put in new ones, discovered that he had all kinds of fluid flowing around that ear canal. They took out his adenoids. He was sick so bad, he gave himself a hernia. So he had a hernia operation on his third birthday. So we were not... Praise God, I was healthy, but they were not as healthy. So we, we had to balance career, we had to balance family, life, medical bills were through the roof. It was tough. Life was real challenging. March of 2010, we separated. Our marriage had been going downhill. I think a lot had to do with the stress of the relation or the on the relationship came from the from the health issues, from stress at work. She had been denied tenure at UT Dallas and for a college professor, that is the kiss of death. Um, she was having a lot of issues. She was taking a lot of medication. In fact, she was taking from depression medicine to pain medicine to side effect medicine. Uh, she was doctor shopping to keep her in meds. She said, oh, I'm not a drug seeker. Yet, she was. Uh, we would uh, have, she would have these fits. These migraines that would last for weeks at a time. I'd say, hey, you know, do, is it real bad? She would go to the emergency room. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going, you got to make a decision. It's midnight. It's not like I can get a babysitter here at midnight. I'm up and out the door in six and a half hours to get Eric to school so I can be to work. I need to know. As a school teacher, you just don't call in sick. You got lesson plans. You got a, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. So it's kind of tough. And all of this stuff just combined and it blew up. I'd gone to my mom and dad's. My folks are, well, they're kind of old. They have a farm out in central Arkansas. Not getting along real well, so I went out there to help them out on chores. She stayed at home. Eric had gone to her mom and dad's up in Kansas. She filed for divorce while I was out of town. Didn't have the courage to tell me that this is what she had done. She tells me over the phone. I say, okay, I don't like this. I wish you had, we'd had an opportunity to talk about this before. I said, but we are not going to tell Eric until I get back home. She goes, that's fine. I get home on, this was on a Thursday, I get home on Saturday, and as I walk in the door, Eric comes up to me, he goes, Daddy, don't move out, because she had already told him. She had already laid the seeds. My mom and dad said, you know what? Of all four kids, I thought you had the marriage that could be just like ours. Now, listening to Suzanne, I understand better her adverse childhood. And I understand the seeds that were planted that I had no idea were there. And it bit me square in the butt. While we were together, it was tough. She engaged in what I now know as parental alienation. She would chastised me 
Eric and I, we would be playing downstairs and we'd be playing with Tinker Toys. He was, we were done with that. And I'd say, okay, well, before we play with the Legos, let's put away the Tinker Toys. He would get upset, throw a fit, start screaming. Well, of course, she was upstairs in the bedroom sick, as she tended to be frequently. She would then holler down. Well, I would ignore her. She would then use her cell phone to call the house phone. I wouldn't answer that. So then she would call my cell phone, and I wouldn't answer that. So at the top of her lung, she would yell, why are you making Eric scream? Stop making him scream. Stop making him yell. Give him whatever he wants. One time, Eric runs upstairs after such a conversation. And I go up after about 10 minutes. And she tells Eric, oh, Eric, don't you worry. He's a mean daddy. I'll get you a new daddy, a daddy that's not so mean. Now, I thought she was just playing. Wow, was the joke ever on me. She didn't like the fact that Eric and I had a great relationship. Why did we have a great relationship? Because I engaged with him. I didn't plop him down in front of the TV. I didn't give him a device. I didn't say, go play on the computer. I didn't arrange tons of play dates. He and I played together. We played Tinker Toys, we played Lincoln Logs, we played Legos, we built puzzles, we drew pictures. We engaged together. I didn't give him money and stuff and toys. I gave him that which I learned from my parents. I gave him my time. And she hated that. It started in the summer of 2010. I questioned, I said, who are these people that are living in our house that are coming and going left and right? As my next door neighbor was telling me of the massive pool parties and the constant visitors in and out. She had roommates that had moved in. According to Eric, uh, she was seeing a guy by the name of Mr. Sean who was sleeping in her bedroom. So we filed an order saying, okay, we, we need to know who these people are. Because she had one friend at a time. That was it. She would consume them and then spit them out when they began to question any of her stories. So where were all these people? She did not have a large collection of friends. So as soon as we file this, Eric tells me, he says, I'm going to kill your lawyer. Because your lawyer made Mr. Sean move out of the house. Mm -hmm. Hmm, wonder where that came from. First accusation, she said that I had physically beat Eric. That I had spanked him so hard on the butt that I'd left my handprint. Well, when CPS investigated, they asked Eric, Eric goes, I don't remember that. When they asked me, I said, no, we don't use that kind of discipline. We do primarily timeouts. So they ended that accusation or that claim. We go on. We get into October of 2010. I get another call from CPS, and they say, uh, Mr. McCall, we need you to come down. So I go, and I visit with this person. It's a different person, a young girl. Oh, I doubt she was 25 yet. And she tells me that Eric has corroborated a claim that I have sexually abused him. And that they are investigating me. And they wanted me to sign paperwork right there to that effect. And I said, uh, no, I'm not signing anything. I said, I didn't do anything. I said, this is baloney. I said, why don't you go and talk to the lady that you know, took the first one back in June. I said, do you understand that this is a woman who is a former police officer? She has a master's in clinical psychology and a PhD in criminology and teaches classes at the local university on etymology. But the CPS worker was not interested in anything I had to say. So this was on a Tuesday, Thursday evening, 
I get a telephone call from CPS saying that uh, my visitation with Eric has been revoked effective instantaneously, that I will not get visitation that weekend, and that um, he is actually going to go live with a longtime friend of the family. I said, well, great, who is it? They tell me. I go, who's that? Well, according to his mother, a longtime family friend, I go, we haven't been separated that long. I don't know this person. I said, can I make a suggestion? They go, no, sorry, the decision's already been made. The next day, Friday, I get called into school. To the, or I, well, at school, I get called into the principal's office, and they sent me down, the principal and one of the assistants, and they say, Rod, you're gone. I go, what? They said, CPS came to talk to Eric at school, and so as a consequence, we're going we're gonna to suspend you effective now. I said, are you kidding me? And I told them the same thing. This is a load of baloney. This is false. This is not true. This is inaccurate. And they didn't care. Because the school district was worried about being sued. I think we heard that earlier today. And as a consequence, I lost my right to see my son and to be the only thing that I'm actually pretty good at. And that's being a school teacher. Pardon? All in less than 24 hours. Then, because CPS was involved, and because of the false allegation, Collin County, Texas, where I live, the Sheriff's Department does a mild investigation, and wouldn't you know, they decide to issue an arrest warrant. Because I am a school teacher, it made the news. So you had ABC, CBS, uh, Fox News, and ABC, all the, the four major networks in our school. So everybody knows all about this. Arrest warrant goes out. Now, as Catherine said, I got lucky. My lawyer happened to be both criminal and family law. Praise the Lord. I had to surrender myself. Was lucky enough to be able to post bail. But I have to tell you, the three, three and a half hours I spent at the jail was some of the worst of my life. Because you know what? That's where people who've done bad things go. What did I do? What was my crime? I married the wrong woman. In the span of a couple of weeks, I lost everything that was dear to me. We go to judge. We see our first court date. It's in uh, October. They get postponed. We ultimately have, uh, after many other wranglings in the court, we finally go in mid-December to the judge. We have a day-long hearing. And at the end of the hearing, the judge grants us our divorce. And he says, 50-50 custody. And I'm going, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He said, visitation, because of the year I was going to get from after Christmas to New Year's, or when school began. So I thought, okay, that's fine. Woo! Feeling pretty good about things. I get notice from my lawyer, Christmas Eve, she's taken Eric down to Children's Hospital in Dallas, checked him into the middle ward because of suicidal ideations and homicidal ideations because everybody knows that a newly minted six-year-old is good at committing suicide or committing murder, because that's what he said. If I have to go with Daddy over Christmas, I'm either going to kill him or kill myself. He spends 30 days down at Children's Hospital. Now, the best thing to happen for me personally was that I was introduced to a therapist. And the idea of speaking to somebody on this was a first for me. I never thought I needed to go to a mental health professional. But part of our procedure or process there, that's exactly what needed to happen. So I'm visiting with the mental health professionals, and that really helped me out quite a bit. So much so that I found my own private therapist. We then, but I still didn't get to see Eric. 
So UPS order from October was still in effect. I don't get to see her. Um, we go to trial in February, and the judge says, my lawyer says, we are going to fight this vigorously. And so he said, we're going to get Eric an ad litem attorney. He said, we are going to get you guys a psychological evaluation. So we do. We spend a day. And the judge orders us to go and get psychologically evaluated. He says, Eric will get an ad litem attorney. And he says, you know, I've heard a lot of allegations and accusations this day from CPS, but I haven't seen a lot of evidence to support it. He says, you know what? This man needs his kid, and this kid needs his dad. He said, today's Thursday. He said, starting tomorrow, I am in, or I, we will get visitation. And so I started every other weekend visitation, standard visitation according to the state of Texas. And I was going, praise the Lord. I missed his birthday. I missed Christmas. But we celebrated it in the middle of February. And we got to go through all of this. The other thing was that we were granted a new trial. The judge threw out his original December 2010 ruling. He said, we're going to start all over. And so we set a new date for what was supposed to be September. It got pushed to October. Between his release in January, after a 30-day stay at Children's Hospital, he went back two more times. What was interesting is that they both happened to coincide with my weekends for the same issues. While he is at Children's Hospital, he is being evaluated by the staff, and they interestingly watch the engagement he has with me and the engagement he has with his mother. She thought she was doing something to destroy me, and instead, well, she discovered, much to her chagrin much later, Sending him to children's turned out to be the worst thing for her. Because they saw what we know was going on. CPS saw me as a villain. First in October, then in February, and again when we have our trial in October of 2011. I've taken a lie detector test. Now, they're not admissible in evidence, but I passed it. Didn't really matter. Didn't matter at all. I felt that, as we heard from Suzanne with her explanations, that was me. I was feeling all of those issues of depression, betrayal, frustration, anger. Anger at the court system that we all know. Anger at the mental health system that we all know. The psychological evaluator came down and he said, well, Rod's not deviant, has no deviant behavior, though he does have a tendency to be um, overly forgiving. He's too nice of a guy. <laughs> he said, but her, he said, she has all the indications of borderline personality disorder, but I wasn't specifically tasked to find that, so I'm not going to officially diagnose her with that. Well, thank you very much. I hated the idea that all of us who have been accused of something that we are guilty until we prove innocent, and it is extremely hard to prove that nothing happened. When nothing happened. I hate the idea that I was guilty in the eyes of so many. Because, well, why would somebody make up a false allegation if there wasn't truth? There had to be smoke. Because where there's smoke, there's fire. Nobody just makes us crap up. In February, as I mentioned, I got more visitation, and things were going pretty good. Through the spring and the summer of 2011, Eric and I were getting along real well. And then she kept putting up roadblocks. My mom and dad celebrated their 50th anniversary the summer of 2011. I said, we got to go. You know, it took me a freaking court order to get Eric to go out of state to go to my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, 
because it could not be allowed to show any emotion, love, or compassion. So we go to trial. We go to trial. A week-long jury trial. Now, I didn't realize just how unusual this is. I thought, okay, Seventh Amendment guarantees me the right to a jury trial in civil cases. She asked for it. She got it. She was finding that the judge wasn't buying her BS, so she thought, well, I can buffalo 12 people. So we go to trial, and it's a week long, and she parades all kinds of people out there. And I got to tell you, when you're married, there's certain things that go on, certain things that you're maybe not the most proud of. And you swear to God, the two of you, that you are going to take those things to the grave. Because if you let them out, well, that's going to be damaging to your parents. They're going to see you in a light that you don't want them to see you in. So what does she do? She shares all that. My mother in the courtroom nearly fainted. She walks up. My ex-wife, she is not a good Catholic. Didn't believe in the Catholic Church. Oh, she was raised and confirmed and we were married to the Catholic. She was a Catholic by name, but didn't like to, it was a disagreement with the church on practically everything. So what does she do? She takes up a freaking rosary when she testifies. But people didn't buy her. And they didn't buy all the people that perjured themselves all week long. The police officer, the sheriff's deputy that investigated me for CPS gets on the stand and he says, you know, if I knew today what I knew when I investigated this man a year ago, I would have never suggested he be arrested. My lawyer says, Rod, he says, I've known this guy for 25 years. I have never seen him apologize, yet he apologized in court today. It all ends, all the testimony ends on Thursday. It goes to the jury Thursday night. They don't find anything to come back Friday morning. We're all excited. Nervous. Nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs nervous. Because whatever they decide, one of us is no longer going to be Eric's mom or dad. Because one of us was going to lose our parental rights. She had filed to strip me of my parental rights, and my lawyer said this is something I would never do. But he says, you know what, if she's going to go down this road, then let's go down this road. And he said, we're going to file just the same on her. So they come back, and a jury, 11 to 1, says that I win. She loses her parental rights. Praise God. Somebody, 11 somebodies, finally believe. Now, the big question is what are we going to do? Well, don't want to bring Eric to the courthouse. Don't want to involve him in all that trauma and drama. And so they say, well, Rod, go, you know, go home. My lawyer says, Rod, go home. Get your boy. So I do. One of my dearest friends and one of my sisters, we jump in my car and we race. From the courthouse. Now, I'm not an NASCAR guy, but I felt like I was driving like a NASCAR man because I was getting to that house. And I get there. And right before we get there, I was thinking, you know, the last three or four exchanges that I'd had with Eric had been really bad, and I just knew this was going to be equally as bad. So I called up the police. I said, hey, can you guys do a courtesy standby? And they say, hey, we've already been alerted. There's cops already on scene. <laughs> I go, oh, crap. So we pull up the street, and there's the police car. Get out, and the cops, you know, I proved who I was. I go up, and I'm knocking on the door. Nobody answers. No, we got dogs. Dogs barking. How old is he? Eric is 10 days shy of his eighth birthday. Now, he had been kept home because he was sick. Her mom and dad were watching him. And... So I'm knocking, and the dogs are barking. They know I'm there. The cops are there. More cops show up. You got cops in the front, cops on the, in the back, because I lived on a corner lot. 
had an alleyway in the back. A little bit later, she pulls up, pulls around in the back. Cops say, hey, you know, uh, she drive a, a white van ago? Yeah, it's a 2004 Pontiac, Montana. They say, okay, well, she just pulled in. I go, oh, Lord. So I'm knocking again. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just knocking on the door. And I knock. I come I knock on the door. And then I take a few steps back. Well, after that last knock and my step back, I look kind of diagonal. And there's her mom and dad across the street. And I'm going, well, why are they there? Why aren't they inside? What's going on here? And that's what I heard. Three gunshots. A little 411. On a gorgeous, gorgeous Friday night or Friday morning. I lost my son. She walked upstairs. Pulled out her old police pistol and shot Eric and then shot herself. Just like what Suzanne described, to, this has been happening to so many folks. It happened to me. I was like that lady, she said, that went to the police department. And I screamed and I yelled. I was devastated. I married my son on his eighth birthday. That was not the gift I had planned to give him. I thought I was all alone. But you know what? I discovered I wasn't. I discovered us. And I said, there has to be a reason for all of this. For all the pain, all the suffering, there has to be a reason. Why did we go through this? And I learned of the phrase, parental alienation. And I have made it my life's goal to educate myself, to educate others. I found two books. I found Divorce Poison by Richard Warshak to be so enlightened and so educational to me. He talks about the parental alienation occurs in three levels. One, a normal level, a normal relationship when the kids are pitting each parent against the other and you go, oh, I let them out in those really short shorts. It's not that big a deal. He said that happens. He said in a divorce, he said usually every family goes up to level two. He said where the parents are so angry that they use the kids as temporary weapons. He said, in fact, my, uh, well, I got remarried almost two years ago. My wife and her ex-husband did level two. They accused, you know, used the kids. But after a couple of months, they realized, oh my gosh, this is having really bad results. The kids were bad, and they realized this is not how we want our children to be raised, and they stopped it. Level three is what we have all experienced, the never-ending cycle. Then in Dr. Childress's book, I learned that there are two personality types that lend themselves almost exclusively to parental alienation, narcissistic personality disorder, and borderline personality disorder. And I have to tell you, my wife had them both in space. So what are we going to do about it? Well, it starts with us here. The great presentations by Suzanne and by Catherine are teaching us skills, information, and knowledge. What do we do with it? Well, we know what it looks like, so how do we describe it to others? Starts by coming here.
taking the information, sharing it with others. Who are these others? The children's school teachers, the children's school counselors, the children's school administrators, talking to our mental health professionals, the counselors, and saying, here is what I've got. Here is what parental alienation, hostile, aggressive parenting looks like, sounds like, and smells like. When you hear these things, when you see these things, know that it is irrational behavior on a child. If you live here in Pennsylvania, in the Erie area, well, you got Lori and her fantastic support group. When you started one down in Dallas. Another friend of ours, Shelly, who makes these medals. She has one in San Antonio. If you don't have one in your community, and that's a skill that you think you have, then use your skill to create a support group, because i got to tell you, if it wasn't for a support group, I'd be still curled up in bed. I would not be here in front of you. I would not have had the courage to write my book. This saved my life. And listening to Lori, it has helped save many other people too. We are not alone. Strength and courage can get us through the darkest of days, that deepest of depressions. The change comes through educating. We did our conference in Dallas last year. We had a lot of mental health professionals. We had a lot of lawyers. I talked to judges. They tell me, Rod, it's a divorce dodge. I'm going, well, judge, let me show you. Judge, let me tell you. Judge, let me explain and share with you. It's not a divorce dodge. There's so much more. We can make a difference. I've seen a difference being made. I'm seeing it all over. You know, we had our very first parental alienation think tank in 2016. We had 75 people show up. That was about three times more than we expected. Um, but it was very impressive that people wanted to come and learn about this. We had our, since then there have been multiple other events going on. We're seeing not only conferences like today, I'm seeing laws being changed. Yesterday, Kentucky said that we're going to go to 50-50 custody and divorces. Now, why is that a big deal? Because Richard Warshak says one of the best ways to combat this is to reduce the amount of time that the alienating parent has with the children. Give the target parent more time. Well, if I get 50% of the time, I'm on my way. More states, like Kentucky, Missouri has done it. Other states have done it. I've seen changes. Wendy and I are doc joining Dr. Childress, as Lori said, to talk to the APA. Not just to talk to them, but to give them signatures. 15,000, I think, is where we're at our target. We started with a target goal of 10. 10,000 signatures. We got it up to 15. Our new target, I think, is somewhere around 20. If you have not signed it, go to Dr. Childress's website and sign it. I was watching Planet of the Apes, the new ones. Apes strong together. We are strong together. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many ways that we can make a change. Each and every one of us has natural God-given talents. Mine, well, I teach. That's what I do. I teach school, but I teach about this. What can we do? Tell others. Teach ourselves and teach others. You can follow me. Uh, go to my website that I have. Um, I'm actually redoing it. Um, one of my former students helped me bake the original one, but I'm trying to redo it, make it a little more interesting. Follow me on for Eric on Twitter. 
trying to uh, put more stuff. I don't do Twitter, but I'm trying to learn. All right. I use every penny of the proceeds from my book to come to places like here, to come and visit with people, to share my story, to help other people. I have shared my book with mental health professionals, with lawyers, with judges. I have a lawyer friend of mine that he buys copies of my book that give them to his clients when they're going through a really rough time, going through what we experience. It is time that we shine a light on the darkness of this type of child abuse. We all know it from firsthand experience. Let's be strong together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.